Hi everyone, and welcome to our webinar where we ask the question, how accurate is your emergency information? No matter which organization or institution you're associated with, sharing emergency information is critical and a standard process for most. Emergencies are considered emergencies because they're unexpected, which makes the collection of emergency and contact and health or medical information so important for your organization. My name is Michelle, and I'm the Marketing Manager here at EPACT. I'll be your host and presenter as we explore the importance of accurate emergency information and the impact it has on your organization and the families that you serve. So before we get started, I thought I'd share a little bit about EPACT uh, in case you'd like to know what we do here. So EPACT is an online emergency network that helps youth rec organizations like rec departments, YMCAs, sports associations, camps, and more move information that's usually collected on paper medical forms, waivers, or consents into a secure cloud-based system. This helps those organizations meet legislative requirements around the collection and management of personal health information. And it also provides authorized users with secure access to critical information when it's needed the most. So think medical emergencies, wide-scale community events, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, um, you can visit our website or connect with us directly by email or phone, and I'll make sure that you have our contact information um, by the end of today's presentation. All righty. So on that note, let's dive into today's topic. So by the end of the session, I hope to leave you with the following three key takeaways. So the first one is understanding how to collect and manage the right information for your participants, whether they're players on a hockey team, um, whether they're camp attendees, whether they're attending you know, regular seasonal programming um, or yearly programming after school care making sure that you have the right information um, for those participants so that you can provide them with the best care. How those information requirements may actually differ between programs or activities. So, you know, the difference between, say, a sports program versus a camp program or an after-school care um, piece as well. And then the third is the importance of ensuring that information is accurate and up-to-date, just as we promised in the topic. Um, that's going to be one of our main key takeaways today is understanding and ensuring um, how, uh, that it's important that it's accurate and up-to-date. So as I mentioned, um, most youth rec organizations will collect health information and emergency contact details from families as they register for their camps or programs. Uh, so whether your organization collects the most basic of information or it goes into very specific detail with those questions will depend on the organization itself as well as the types of programs and activities that you provide. Um, so if you're only doing, uh, hosting one program, one activity, you're going to probably ask for a lot less information, although it will be specific to that program or activity, um, than an organization that perhaps has a very wide um, programming, uh, breadth of programming. At the very least, though, most organizations will collect emergency contact information for a player or a participant, um, and also general details about any existing medical conditions or allergies that can impact um, a participant while they're taking part in a program or activity. Um, and that really helps program staff make sure that they're aware before a program starts and they can make the necessary accommodations um, depending on uh, that particular piece of information. So I'd like you to consider the following scenario. And I'd like you to just kind of keep this in mind like, as we go through the presentation. Um, this is interestingly, a, a fairly common occurrence for a lot of organizations. So in this case, we have Jane, she's six years old, and she actually recently developed an allergy to peanut butter. So in the spring, it's a new, a new allergy um, that she's been uh, diagnosed with uh, by her doctor. And her reactions are pretty severe. However, she doesn't carry an EpiPen. Um, her mom enrolled her in camp for this coming, um, this coming season and forgot to mention this new allergy when they registered. And that was either because it was, the question wasn't asked or she didn't think to add it. Either way, she didn't provide that allergy information when they registered. Now, although it wasn't Jane's first summer at camp, this was new information, but camp staff did not ask for updated medical information. So they're just assuming that the information they, that Jane's mom or dad provided when she first signed up um, for that particular organization, that that information was good to go. So as I said, keep that in mind um, as we go through the presentation today, um, just as I said, because it's a fairly common scenario. Um, and as we will we'll go through, we'll get started um, with our first spot. So it's collecting and managing the right information. So it's not entirely uncommon 
so as I said, this like scenario is not entirely uncommon for any youth rec or recreation organization. So you've got busy parents, they're registering their kids for programs, and usually not one at a time. They're usually registering their kids for, for multiple programs or activities, especially when it comes to the summer and, and keeping them busy while they're out of school. They'll be filling information out in a hurry, um, and unless they're asked for it, they can actually forget to provide additional key information that staff really do need to know. Um, so when you're considering a scenario like this, it actually helps staff think about and identify the type of information that should be collected and managed across programs, and also why it's really important to do so. So let's get into the types of information that you may already be collecting, but you should definitely at least consider collecting too. Um, so as we mentioned before, at the very least, any organization hosting any program aimed at youth is going to collect emergency contact information for parents, legal guardians, and or alternate contacts. And that usually includes, at the very least, again, their names and their phone numbers, so the, the best and the fastest way to, to get in touch with them if they need to. But it might also extend to additional methods of contact, so like email addresses, home telephone numbers for those of us that still have them. Um, and especially again in the case of youth programs, pickup details are often also included here. They help identify who can pick up a child once a program is over or in the event of an emergency pickup where a child has to be picked up quickly. For example, there was a, like an unexpected flood in, the, in one of the community centers um, or there's an incoming storm and children need to make it home quickly and safely. Um, so those, in, those pieces of information are really important, but also if there's anyone who cannot pick up a child. So it's um, part of the pickup list, but it's also information that states that somebody cannot pick up a child for any reason. You need to make sure that your staff have that information in the first place, and also that they have that information um, easily accessible, and also that the right staff have that information. So making sure that anyone who's responsible for checking, out the, checking off that children you know, have been picked up by the right person um, and not the wrong, you need to make sure that those people have access to that information as well when you get it. Um, and it, it, goes, it stands to reason that um, this information can change at any time, and it often does. People get these cell phone numbers, they'll move house, so there's that critical information that's changing. Alternate guardians can also change for any reason. Either somebody's no longer able to perform the role of an alternate guardian, perhaps they've moved out of the area, um, and it's no longer convenient or easy for them to, um, to play a part in being an alternate pickup um, in the event that a parent or guardian cannot um, get to their child in time. And then also changes in personal situations can mean that parent or legal guardian updates um, are also required. Um, and again, really hard to predict those, um, but it's important to capture that information as and when it changes. So our next piece of information that's also really important, um, and we'll probably see that this is more common than anything, um, is, it, is allergy information. So allergies seem to be more prevalent than ever today. Um, and with children being exposed to outdoor camp environments or programs where there's other kids, there might be food that they're not familiar with, or just they're generally spending time outside their home, allergies that are often well managed can actually become a concern during, during these programs or camps or activities. So to kind of put that into perspective, I thought I'd find a few quick facts to share with you. Um, these are from the Food Allergy Research and Education website, and also the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America as well. So a few of the stats that, that I pulled, there are, there are many more if you wanted to take a look yourself. But when it comes to food allergies, each year in the US, 200,000 people require emergency medical care for allergic reactions to food. And that doesn't state that they're necessarily known reactions to food either. Um, you know, as, as with, uh, unfortunately, with many food allergies, they can occur completely out of the blue and unexpectedly, um, which is when you realize that you have one. Um, allergic conditions are the most common health issues affecting children in the United States. So that's what's really prevalent to these um, youth rec organizations. In 2015, 8.8 .8 million children had skin allergies while 4.2 million children had food allergies. So it's a lot of kids, and especially if they're spending a lot of their time you know, in, uh, in recreation programs um, throughout the year, uh, it's, it's, that's a significant number of kids that need to have that information shared. Um, for those with drug allergies, penicillin is the most common al allergy tr trigger, with up to 10% of people reporting an allergy to it. So again, if you have to you know, provide medical care, you're gonna wanna know if, um, if a child that you're uh, trying to care for uh, actually has a penicillin, a penicillin allergy. 
Uh, one to six percent of people in the U.S. have a latex allergy. That's really important, especially if you're providing medical care, like say you have a nurse on site, or if you are handing a child over to um, a paramedic uh, once an ambulance arrives. Really need to be aware of things like a latex allergy. And as I said, that's one to six percent of people. Um, so it's again might be one of those allergies that people are not yet aware of until they come into contact um, with those latex gloves, for example. And 5% of the population has insect sting allergies. Um, so those could range from anywhere from just causing extra irritation. Um, I know that happens for me. Um, but unfortunately, 90, at least 90 to 100 deaths occur each year due to anaphylaxis following a sting. And so for those unfamiliar, anaphylactic shock is the severe reaction um, to, uh, to an allergy or to an allergen um, of any kind. And when it comes to... Um, uh, stings, uh, that can be really serious, especially if somebody doesn't carry things like an EpiPen or have access to allergy medication quick enough. So as you can see, with these like, really impactful stats, it's really important to collect as much information about the types of allergies that participants can experience and suffer from, the severity of a reaction, and also what treatment is needed so that staff know how to manage and respond to an allergic reaction should it occur. Of course, we all hope that there won't be an allergic reaction. We're probably going to take steps to uh, do what we can to keep that child away from allergens if they have specific food allergies, making sure that they don't come into contact with peanuts or soy or, or uh, milk products, for example. Um, but there are going to be times when a child may experience an allergic reaction that perhaps they weren't aware of. And in the case of someone like Jane, in our example scenario, making sure that staff know about new allergies as and when they happen or even those that don't exist anymore, because things change with kids pretty quickly, is really vital to providing the best support while participants are in your care. And also, don't forget to collect the medication or equipment needed to respond to reaction. Um, many participants are, uh, tend to be well-versed in their um, solutions to an allergic reaction if it occurs. Many know how to use an EpiPen, for example. They know to take allergy medication. But also, you'll want to know that too, just so that you have your own supplies too on the off chance a kid left their EpiPen in their other backpack before they came to camp that day, for example. So that's allergies. Um, the next vital piece of information um, that you know, many rec organizations do already collect it, but it's medical conditions. And kids can experience such a variety of medical conditions, whether they're short-term um, or more chronic illnesses, which can impact their ca experience at camp if st staff aren't made aware of them. So just with allergies, again, collecting information on the types, of um, medical conditions, the severity of those medical conditions, and also the treatment. Um, it just helps create a safe, aware environment for participants, and it means that staff have all the information they need to prepare or respond accordingly in the event of anything occurring. And one other consideration to keep in mind is whether medical conditions create limitations for specific activities or environments. So it might just be that a condition prevents a child from participating in specific kinds of activities, or they have to adjust it slightly. But again, knowing that information up front, program staff can set the right expectations for families based on the activity that they're registering for, or even provide alternative options so that participants don't miss out on their favorite activities. All right. So moving on um, to, oh, sorry, I missed one thing here. So we've got special accommodations. So that kind of follows on from the you know, specific medical conditions. There are special accommodations. So if you have um, <clears throat> participants that require specialized care, it's important for adaptive rec staff, if you have them, to have as much information, again, as possible to prepare their programs. And it helps everyone safely participate in, in any activities that they have planned as well. Outside of like specific adaptive rec programming, it might also be helpful to collect other information, such as phobias or behavioral issues, or if um, kids have various other, um, maybe less physically obvious or generally less obvious um, conditions uh, that might affect their experience at camp, because that allows camp staff to have a more complete understanding of a child's needs, and it means that they can then provide the appropriate support and just continue to facilitate that all-inclusive environment for all kids. So again, camp, camp and all the summer programming, and programming across the year is so exciting for kids to be a, a part of that this just really helps to, to facilitate that and ensure that everybody can enjoy their time. And then we have dietary requirements. So this can include anything from religious dietary practices. So for example, if someone is kosher or if someone is uh, celebrating um, religious festivals, for example, like Ramadan, where they're not eating during the day, 
knowing those things is, is, is important uh, when it comes to dietary requirements. There are lifestyle choices that people might make. They may be vegetarian, uh, vegan, pescatarian, um, you know, any kind of the uh, different food choice uh, options that people make. Um, to special diets for things like for health reasons. So if somebody is celiac or they happen to have diabetes, they're going to eat their food um, very differently from, uh, from anyone who doesn't suffer from those, those illnesses. And to some families, adhering to dietary preferences in those respects is as critical as avoiding certain foods due to sensitivities or allergies. So again, having this information available, it helps program staff make sure that there are specific preparation requirements in place. Uh, they're not feeding a child perhaps who is following Ramadan, for example, and is not supposed to be eating during the day. Um, you know, making allowances and accommodations for, for all of those uh, possible options. Um, and it also provides a way uh, for kids to have perhaps get their food at a different time or have what's called food safe spaces. Now those are usually uh, more directed to kids with food allergies, um, but it might also be part of a requirement that's, that a family has as well. Um, so all, knowing those things before a program or activity start really help um, family, uh, sorry, really help program staff um, to make sure that, that things are dealt with ahead of time um, so that they're not scrambling to try and do things on the fly, um, which can, can lead to a sort of a degraded experience for that as well. So that's generally the information that you should at least consider um, collecting if you're not already doing so. Um, but one other factor in determining the type of information that your organization should be collecting is the breadth of your program. And this is how those, those, that critical information requirements will actually differ between programs. So you might not need everything for every program, but you may need to adjust for the different types of activities you offer so that the right information is captured and ready anytime you might need it. So just a few examples of how information might differ across programs are, for example, so overnight camps. They, you know, organizers and staff would probably expect things like dietary requirements and food allergies ahead of meal prep um, because participants are going to be eating, uh, you know, at least a, a couple of their meals a day um, at camp, especially, again, if it's an overnight camp, there's going to be breakfast, lunch, dinner, there might be snacks along the way. So again, having that food information ahead of time is really great for them. Sports camps or programs might require injury or concussion information to make sure that um, a child doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. As with concussion, they need to make sure that they're following their return to play protocols. Um, again, and that goes for sports camps or um, sports associations. Um, or even they might need a doctor's note that the a participant is in good health before starting. It might depend. We had. Um, just an example off the top of my head, um, there was a, uh, a client of ours who happened to have, um, they did adult camps, and <clears throat> one of their programs was for um, a particularly long mountain hike, and they had um, an 80-something gentleman who had registered for the program. So it was things like making sure that he was capable of doing that, understanding the strenuous activity that it was going to involve, and making sure that he was um, in a healthy uh, mindset and also physically healthy enough to be able to take care of that. So it's not, not designed to discriminate, but just meant to um, set in place that, again, we're, meeting, we're setting expectations and then we're helping families to meet those expectations as they go. Educational or classroom-based programs might require less specific information overall, but they might benefit from the collection of things like allergy and medication details um, or existing health conditions, any special accommodations. For example, if a child has learning difficulties, um, making sure that, uh, that they have uh, accommodations to, to fit that as well. Seasonal camps might need allergy information, dietary details, um, and also those special accommodations for participants that require additional support in their activities. Things like after-school care and other licensed programs usually require specific health information um, like immunization records before a child can register, and that's often required by state law. So if you're an organization that's in a particular region, um, you may find that when it comes to specific programs, you don't have an option to or not to collect um, information, um, that it's specifically laid out as to the details that you need to make sure you have for each participant. And in addition to that, you might also have different waivers and consents based on the program or activities that participants are joining. So for example, if you're hosting a summer camp, you might ask parents to sign a sunscreen application consent, but you wouldn't necessarily have that for a fall or a winter program, for obvious reasons. Um, so whatever you're collecting for each program, again, 
make sure that information is accurate so your staff can prepare and provide the best care in the event of an emergency, so making sure that they're responding accordingly as well. And I guess a side topic that I wanted to explore a little with, uh, with our listeners, um, following the note I made earlier about organizations that may choose to collect only minimal information, some organizations may choose not to collect anything at all. And I thought it would be valuable to explore why they, they do so or why they avoid collecting critical information for their participants. And we find that it's usually one or more of the following reasons, or either a combination or a variation of these as well. So. Um, some organizations feel that they don't need critical information because either the programs that they offer um, don't really require anything more than knowing an emergency contact and uh, you know, their details and their phone numbers or a pickup list, for example. Um, or they consider the information that they do have enough. Again, whether it's just that emergency contact detail or maybe they collect a couple of extra things um, outside of that, but they might just feel that that's sufficient for their program. Um, Organizations might be forced to use paper forms to collect anything outside of the standard registration information. So you're collecting you know, first name, birth date, last name, um, address, parental information. But outside of that, for anything that's considered emergency or critical information, um, paper forms are often required. And in that case, paper forms are really difficult to manage, which also makes them extremely time consuming for staff and the families that you serve as well. So it's only natural in this case that already busy staff, they're prepping for camps, they're prepping for programs, they're getting everybody in, they're doing follow-ups with families as needed. They're hesitant to add another task to their long list of responsibilities that they already have. And following on from that, paper forms and their processes are usually manual for many teams. They don't often have extra staff to either handle the collection and management of those forms, or they don't have the time to follow up with families when information is like missing, or it's incorrect, or they just can't read it. Um, so a number of things that just kind of add to it with that manual process. And also, rec management systems are designed for program or class registration. They help with membership management, point of sale, booking meeting rooms. There are so many things. Like rec management systems are, are superbly robust, but they're not really designed for collecting emergency information. And on that note as well, they're also not usually HIPAA compliant either. Um, so there are two scenarios that come out of that. Uh, when you can't collect that information within a rec management system, you're either going to get partial information where families have thought, or you know, it's, there's a, a notes or a free text section where families can add a little bit of extra information that is necessary, um, or they're collecting information, or they're assuming that families will provide that information without being prompted for it. So they might just have you know, a note section that says, please provide anything else that we might need to know. So families may just say, so-and-so has a peanut allergy, and leave it at that. There's no information about how severe the allergy is, if they require an EpiPen, what the treatments are, all those kinds of things. Um, so that assumption that families will provide that, a hint is that they don't, and if they, if they do happen to provide some information, it's not usually in the required amount of detail that would be useful in the event of an emergency medical scenario. Um, and finally, Organizations may actually just be unaware that the information they're already collecting, or that they're not, isn't as thorough as it could or should be. They may not have had to use that information to date um, for an emergency. They may have been lucky enough that they've not had to experience or use any of that. Or they happen to have other processes that have been used to satisfy their needs in, in a scenario where emergency information would be used. And so, these, as I mentioned, these are really common objections, and they're actually ones we hear a ton here at EPAC. Um, but I am sure that they're not the only challenges that rec organizations experience um, on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. So on that note, in response to those challenges, we find it's important for organizations and the families they serve to understand why, why it's important to collect that critical information. Generally, it's to ensure and provide the highest level of safety while staff are responsible for participants in their care. There is no doubt that parents want their kids to be safe at all costs, no matter what they're doing. So whether they're swimming, or whether they're going on a hike, or they're just enjoying camp or activities, safety is their number one priority, especially because kids are often out um, of the home and they're under someone else's um, care. And that's where having information that goes beyond the traditional registration data really helps staff provide that peace of mind to families and that reassurance that kids are safe and that they only ever need to focus on enjoying those activities while they are um, as in that camp or program. So let's get into these ones. 
So detailed information helps staff prepare themselves to support participants in any type of emergency. So it complements existing training and certifications that many recreation staff absolutely have to have before they start anyway, so things like first aid and CPR. And it means that staff can respond as quickly as possible if they need to. Um, so if a child does have an allergic reaction, they, they know this ahead of time and they know what to expect rather than having to discover what the child is potentially allergic to and find out what the responses are and, and so on. Um, and this information actually might also highlight areas where extra training can be beneficial for staff. So, and when organizations respond to that, it demonstrates their commitment to the safety of their participants, that they, they realize that you know, they might need some additional training for either individuals or as an organization as a whole, um, and then they're helping to, to demonstrate that, again, safety of their participants is, is their top priority. Knowing about specific conditions or requirements means that staff can plan for customized care and support ahead of time. So that's especially key in the case of participants that really need special accommodations or those that have very specific dietary requirements or sensitivities. We're reducing the element of surprise, which means that everyone can focus on the fun they're going to have, and that goes for participants and staff. And um, parents and staff can take comfort knowing that they're as prepared as possible. So again, we're not dealing with uh, an issue as it arises and having staff who have no idea um, and they have to start, start searching for information in that moment where obviously time is of the essence. Um, having more than just a name and a birth date means that in the case of a medical emergency or an injury, staff can actually provide intermediate care until a participant can either get to the nurse, if there's a nurse on site or you have medical staff or um, doctors on site, um, or an ambulance arrives with medical personnel, paramedics, et cetera. Um, and this is really helpful, especially in the case of if medical services are delayed for any reason. So think about those times when um, you might be at an off-site activity where you're not near your camp nurse, for example, um, or you're off-site camping and it might just be a bit more, a bit more challenging for um, an ambulance to reach you. This can have a significant impact on the participant, especially if their situation is a little more serious. So every minute counts, and so if staff can confidently provide intermediate care, again with that information to hand, it can make all the difference for a participant prior to them being handed over to um, medical uh, professionals. And then finally, phone trees. I'm sure everyone is familiar with phone trees. They've been relied upon by program staff for the longest time. And while they used to be convenient, with so many ways to communicate with families, think you can uh, call them, and you can call them on their cell phone, or you can call them on their house phone, text messages, instant messages, emails, social media, the list goes on, and with information changing so often. Having those extra details means that staff can communicate with families in emergency contacts much easier instead of dialing a number and either being met with a, a voicemail or it might be an incorrect or an out of service number. There's nothing worse than having incorrect information preventing staff from connecting with a parent, a legal guardian, an alternate contact especially if a child needs to be picked up early or there's been an emergency or there's a delay in returning from an off-site activity. It prevents that escalating level of chaos that, um, that can ensue with these unexpected um, situations. So circling back around to the main topic of our, um, of our webinar, why it's important to collect this information and make sure that it's accurate and up-to-date when you need it the most. So whether you already collect this information, or you're you collect some of it and you're considering doing so, or even if you're not considering at all, here are just a few of the reasons why accuracy of information is vital. So in a medical emergency uh, of any kind, outdated prescriptions or old medical conditions can affect the treatment an individual receives. So in the case of Jane, for example, she has a new peanut allergy that has pretty severe consequences, but she doesn't carry an EpiPen, and that would be the appropriate uh, response to a medical emergency if she came into contact with, with peanuts anywhere during her program. Um, children's health needs change really quickly as well. So as you can see, they can go from one season to another, one program to another, one camp to another, one year to another, um, and things can change. New allergies can show up, new dietary requirements can show up, kids can grow out of things as well. So it's really important to know that you're not also treating a child who may have had uh, a peanut allergy in the past and required an EpiPen, now they just get, they get a little extra you know, swelling around uh, a bee sting, for example, but doesn't require an EpiPen, but now they might just need some regular allergy medication. So it's really important to understand um, what information you're dealing with and keeping it up to date. So you want to make sure that they are 
not treating a participant based on old information, as that's going to create problems of its own. In the case of a widespread emergency, so think of something like flooding, which is, per, which is common, and it is most common in the spring and summer, but it's the most common natural disaster or weather event across North America. Um, or if you're in a region that experiences earthquakes, um, like us here in the Pacific Northwest, or somewhere where a forest fire, and that can literally happen anywhere um, in the country. Inaccurate contact information for an alternate guardian would mean that a child isn't picked up quickly, especially if a parent or legal guardian isn't available immediately. Perhaps they're not picked up at all, which is definitely a scenario that we want to avoid. avoid. Or they're picked up by someone who's not an authorized contact for any reason. It's that the, you know, the parents don't, don't know, um, or the parents haven't authorized, or it's somebody who used to be an, uh, an authorized contact and should no longer be for any, any particular reason. All of those scenarios affect the safety of a participant. Um, it's, it's preventing them from connecting them with their families um, following, following a significant event. And finally, for those who do collect critical information, many do so as part of the registration process. You're doing it all at the same time as you're collecting the, that uh, immediate information as well as payment details. Um, that's often well ahead of a program start date. So if registration opens in January for a spring break camp that happens in March or April, a lot can happen between that information being submitted and the potential need to use it. So when spring break camp starts, it's usually going to be a few days to a week, but that's a big gap of three to four months in there. And on that note, one of the stats we found, we did some research here at EPAC ourselves, is that over the course of about four months, 30% of forms fall out of date. And again, that goes back to children's um, health needs changing positively or negatively very quickly, people updating their contact information, people moving home, houses, all of those things. Um, that's a lot of information that can potentially be referenced in an emergency situation that is outdated in one way or, the, or another. So again, just imagine the consequences of trying to treat um, a participant or make sure they get the right care based on old information. So as you can see, it's in everyone's best interest to have the most up-to-date, accurate health information. So also you want to consider how you can make it easy for families to let your staff know when those details change, especially if they're changing a lot. So somebody gets a new cell phone number, or they change their address, or they update an emergency contact. Again, perhaps somebody has moved away and they're no longer a suitable emergency contact, or they didn't have any emergency contacts before and now they do. Um, so making sure that your staff also then have an easy way to get that information. So providing families with a way to provide it, a way for staff to access it, so that if it does change, they have an easy way to get that and as quickly as possible. So for example, and here's a little bit of a, a plug on our part, that's where a tool like EPAC can help. So our system gives families the ability to update information as it changes. So they just log into their account, they update whatever piece of information um, requires it, and that actually provides staff with those updates in real time. That they'll get an alert, they'll get an update that says, you know, Jane's mom has now updated Jane's account um, with this information. So in the case of our scenario, going back to it again, she's now been able to update that. Um, Jane uses an EpiPen, for example. Um, and that really helps eliminate the need to worry about filling out change forms and making sure that those get to the right people and that they're caught in time just before, you know, before a program or camp starts or finding someone to manually change an existing form. This goes back again to those paper forms. If things are stored in a filing cabinet somewhere, somebody's got to go and find it, they've got to pull it out, they've got to make sure that they change it, we have to make sure it stays legible, so on and so forth. So, as you can see, we have covered, I feel like we've covered a little, a lot today. Um, so, with that being said, we're at the end of our presentation. Um, I thought I'd give you a quick summary the import, uh, of the importance of accurate health and emergency information. It's critical to the well-being of your participants. You're helping staff prepare and respond to potential emergencies, all of which we cannot predict. Um, you're providing peace of mind for families. As soon as they drop their kids off at the local community center or camp or the, you know, the off-site activity, they have peace of mind that their kids are in great hands. As I said, it helps staff provide the best care, whether they're treating themselves or if they are providing interim treatment or if it gets more serious and they have to provide treatment and then pass on to a medical professional. Again, it gives all of that key information that's, that's really helpful. Um, and not only does it do that, but it actually also dramatically reduces your organization's risk and liabilities when it comes to providing care. You have that information. Your staff aren't making educated guesses. They aren't hoping that they have the right answers. They will know because they have that information to hand. 
So as I promised at the top of the presentation, if you do have any questions or you'd like to learn more about EPAC, you can visit our website at www.epacnetwork.com or you can actually reach out to our sales team by phone or email um, at your convenience. And that information is on screen now. So thanks again for joining me today. I really hope that you found today's content valuable and that you'll join us again on a future webinar.